It's no secret that space has had a tremendous impact on human life and civilization as we know it, whether we're talking about valuable resources, potential for scientific innovation, or the answers to very big existential questions. Space is the place. We've been able to learn so much from our time in space, mostly because living in space is really, really hard. There are natural dangers, mechanical errors, and unless you're a robot, you're gonna need food, water, and air to keep the party going. All in all, we've gotten good at living up there in the harshness of space. But thanks to hyper-industrialization and the subsequent effects of climate change, it's getting harder to live down here on Earth too. Can what we've learned from living in space with limited resources help us live with less down here? Over the course of the last 60 years and many, many missions into space, we've learned a lot about what it takes to live in space. The first human in space was Yuri Gagarin on board Vostok 1 launched by the Soviet Union in 1961. His legendary trip was less than two hours long. Later, flights lasted much longer. Vostok 6, the flight that carried the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova, was almost three days long. The food packed for Valentina was apparently so bad that it caused her to vomit. Years later, Apollo 11, the American launch that took Neil Armstrong to the moon, lasted a little over eight days. Though humans weren't really living in space until space stations became a reality, the concept of a space station, a satellite capable of supporting a human crew in Earth orbit, has existed in science fiction since the mid-19th century. Currently, the International Space Station is in low Earth orbit and has been there since it was launched back in 1998. The International Space Station can house seven crew members. Long-term crew members operate in six-month-long expeditions. Supplies are sent up once every 40 to 45 days. To accommodate more crew, extend the time crew can stay in space, and significantly reduce the cost of operating the space station, NASA has developed a closed-loop system known as the Environmental Control and Life Support System. Composed of regenerative life support hardware that provides clean air and water to the International Space Station crew and laboratory animals through artificial means. Water is super necessary, but it's also super heavy. No matter where you are, heavy things are expensive to move. Up until 2008, astronauts had to rely only on water transported from Earth. But after that, the International Space Station's closed-loop system was upgraded to recycle astronaut wastewater. Used water is captured, filtered to remove contaminants and impurities, and then made available for reuse. More than 90% of recaptured water is made available for reuse. I can almost read your mind. You're wondering where that reusable water comes from, aren't you? But I bet you already know. Wastewater is captured from the moisture from astronaut breath, condensation in the air, astronaut sweat, and yes, even from their urine. NASA spent $19 million to buy a Russian-designed space toilet. Crew members strap in, literally, so they don't float away, relieve themselves, and contribute to the station's water needs. While reusing water like this might raise a few eyebrows, the recycled water is actually cleaner than some of the water we drink on Earth. The air on the ISS is the result of the oxygen generation system. The OG system works by breaking up water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen and then releasing that new oxygen into the station's atmosphere. The advanced closed loop system does what it sounds like it does and closes the loop, recycling exhaled carbon dioxide back into usable oxygen. When it comes to food, in the beginning of space life, options were limited. The very first space meals had to be eaten by sucking on straws. Space food of the early 1960s was based on army survival rations, and it consisted of pureed food being packed into aluminum tubes and sucked through a straw. Things have come a long way since space baby food and ointment tubes. Today, the International Space Station crew gets to pick their space meals from a menu of over 150 options before they make the trip up there. On the ISS, the vegetable production system, known as Veggie, is currently used to better understand plant growth in microgravity environments and to provide some fresh veggies for floating astronauts. 
Advanced hydroponic systems house each delicate plant in a small pillow of clay-like material that contains crucial nutrients and water. LED lamps are typically used to provide constant light as some astronauts aboard the ISS moonlight as farmers and grow their own lettuce and more. On Earth 2, life is getting harder than ever to sustain and support. We are consuming the Earth's resources at an ever-increasing pace. For example, in the last 75 years, our consumption of metals has grown 20-fold. In the last eight years, it has doubled. Scientists using computational models estimate that at current rates of population and consumption growth, resources may start running out as soon as the 2040s. While energy sources may be plentiful, most of our energy comes from burning fossil fuels which release additional CO2 into the atmosphere. Atmospheric CO2 has now reached 416 parts per million, the highest it's been for nearly a million years, a third higher than what it was in 1950. Since CO2 traps heat, this has resulted in the Earth being 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer compared to the long-term average. In 1950, we emitted 6 billion tons of CO2 each year. Today, we emit nearly six times more. Clearly, we are well into a serious climate crisis. We are far beyond merely watching out for the climate change impact of what we do. We have to work actively to cut CO2 emissions and find alternative ways to do the things that we want to do that emit CO2. In 2019, building construction was responsible for 38% of energy-related global CO2 emissions. To reach net zero, construction-related CO2 emissions would have to fall by 6% each year. Instead, they're going in the opposite direction. Projected emissions could double by 2050, according to United Nations Environment. More than half of the world's population now live in urban areas, increasingly in highly dense cities. These kinds of super-dense urban areas are a relatively new thing this urbanization mostly happening over the last 200 years of human history. Scientists project that by 2050, the global population will increase to around 9.8 billion people, with more than two-thirds of the world living in urban areas. That's a projected 6.7 billion people across the world living in dense urban areas. To accommodate this rapid urbanization around the world, Experts predict that we'll add 2.4 trillion square feet of new building floor area globally by 2060. This means roughly adding an entire New York City to the world every month for 40 years. As we continue building more and more of them, it's important to understand that building cities is dirty work. CO2 emissions are already terrible, but the bulk of waste from construction and demolition ends up clogging up landfills. In the European Union, 75% of construction and demolition waste goes into landfills. In the UK, construction and demolition waste makes up about 50% of all the material that goes into landfills. In the US, construction and demolition waste has grown threefold since the 1990s. Architecture is as old as civilization itself. The Industrial Revolution brought about mass production and consumption, bringing new technologies and new kinds of building materials. But today, the amount of CO2 emissions and landfill waste have created a demand, from both a scientific and social standpoint, for yet another architectural paradigm shift. The obvious and pronounced strain of urbanization has resulted in a demand for more sustainable architecture. The goal being to minimize the negative environmental impact of buildings by implementing various measures. Being energy efficient is key, designing buildings so that they're heated, ventilated, and cooled without wasting excess energy. As it turns out, these days, minimizing environmental impact is also a way to maximize potential profit. The global green building materials market size was estimated at more than $190 billion in 2021. Increasing demands for energy-efficient buildings and favorable government policies for green buildings are driving the market's growth. But it's becoming increasingly clear that just minimizing environmental impact is not enough to stave off the long-term effects of climate change. Regenerative architecture and related design elements go a step further, actively working to reverse damage and leave a net positive impact on the environment. It's not enough to just mitigate the effects of human activity we need to reverse the ecological footprint to pre-industrialization levels. Green roofs are fairly common in today's building design industry, 
but we can also design buildings with skins that actually clean the ambient air and sequester carbon. Designing constructed wetlands that capture and naturally store stormwater is a useful tool that replenishes the underground aquifer. It's important to not only design buildings that use less energy, but to also design them to produce and store energy on site so that there is less to no reliance on the utility grid. Energy stored on site via microgrids can be used by the building during the night hours. New technologies are on the horizon, like biodigesters that convert solid waste into usable energy. There are plenty of ways in which space technology has began to impact how we think, live, and build here on Earth. Some are small, like the water purification products on the market that have been developed using the same special resins that help to control microbial growth in water on the International Space Station. Others are a direct result of the development of net zero, or completely self-contained living quarters for use in space. Interstellar Labs is a tech company developing a module-based living quarters called Experimental Bioregenerative Station, or eBIOS for short. eBIOS is a self-sufficient, self-sustaining settlement to be built in the Mojave Desert in California. It will generate its own food, water, and recycle all the waste it produces. This prototype village will only be able to support 100 people, but this kind of modular structure could serve as a prototype for future space colonies on the moon, or Mars, or even life here on Earth. One of the pods the company is working on is their Biopod, a module dedicated to crop cultivation. Designed to maintain very specific and precise climatic conditions, the pod has the potential to grow hundreds of species of plants in almost any location. While the applications of this in space are obvious, it could also have potential applications here on Earth. Firstly, it can grow any kind of food locally, regardless of season and climate, instead of transporting food halfway across the world, which is a major source of CO2 emissions. Secondly, Biopod aims to reduce water consumption by about 98%, consumes 20 times less energy, and can potentially boost yields up to 100 times over when compared to conventional agriculture methods. In the meantime, the company plans to use the Earth prototypes for research, demonstration, and even tourism. These prototypes are compelling visions into the future. It's exciting to think about entire cities of regenerative homes, businesses, and vegetable garden pods working hard to undo the damage aggressive urbanization is doing to the planet. The adoption of these kinds of net-zero regenerative technologies will likely be slow and, of course, expensive at first. But with increasing interest in helping humans live, breathe, and eat in deep space, hopefully it's just a matter of time before the cost of regenerative tech down here drops. But if we do end up living in pods, can we all promise to never call ourselves pod people? That movie still gives me nightmares. For more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel right now and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look out for Curiosity Stream on social media. Links in the description.